Welcome to the second lecture of 2016 of the Health Optimization Medicine Lecture Series for Continuing Basic Medical Education. Now, you guys all know what continuing medical education is. It is an update of your clinical information that you use in your clinical practice. But I started a, co a concept called continuing basic medical education. So what is it? Continuing basic medical education is a refresher of basic medical information that we have probably forgotten that forms the basis of our clinical practice. For example, in January of this year, a woman gave me a printout from Yahoo Beauty, of all places, um, of the news that magnesium could help prevent deadly pancreatic cancer because her sister died of pancreatic cancer. So. Before I could even pull up the journal article, which uh, was at the British Journal of Cancer, Magnesium Intake and Incidence of Pancreatic Cancer, the Vitamins and Lifestyle Study, what is it that I need to refresh in my mind about magnesium and its relationship to cancer? It is this, uh, we know that we remember that magnesium is actually a cofactor uh, in about over 300 enzymes in the body. And its relationship to cancer is right here. It is actually a cofactor in DNA replication, DNA repair, DNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase. Now, but you say, but Dr. Ted, I measure serum magnesium. Does this look like a serum to you? Actually, it doesn't. But so can we measure intracellular magnesium? We can. Um, the highest correlation with intracellular magnesium is actually um, intra-RBC magnesium, and we could actually measure it from here. These stats are available here in the Philippines. So, CBME is an update of medical information from when we graduated from medical school. Now, your patient comes in and then brings in this journal art, this, this uh, news article that says autism can be avoided and treated with vitamin D, a doctor says, and then also brings the book that's written by this doctor. Now before you can go pull out the paper writ written by our guest lecturer tonight in FASEB uh, entitled Vitamin D Hormone Regulates Serotonin Synthesis Part 1, uh, Relevance for Autism, we should update our information that we learned from medical school. When we were in medical school, we were taught that vitamin D was hydroxylated in the liver and then activated in the kidney and then exerted its calcium metabolic effects. Now, uh, that is the classic endocrine pathway, but that's only 15% of the activation of vitamin D itself. It has been found that 85% actually goes through the autocrine paracrine pathway where one alpha hydroxylase is actually found in virtually all cells of the body and therefore the effects of vitamin D are a protein affecting immune, the immune system, the endothelial function, uh, the renin angiotensin system, uh, its anti-cancer effects as, uh, in cell, uh, like in cell differentiation, in uh, epigenetic signaling and um, in uh, tumor induced apoptosis. Now, if we just stuck with our classic pathway, we know that uh, rickets can be prevented at 20 nanograms per milliliter, but over 30, over 30 milligrams per milliliter, we know that it actually decreases incidence of cancers, like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and diabetes, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, and heart attacks. Now, you can get your vitamin D tested uh, for your patients in your hospital or there's a point of care test for vitamin D. It uh, takes about 10 minutes and a drop of blood, two lines, and you're deficient and the cutoff is about 32 nanograms per ml. Now, let's go back to uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's article in 2014. She relates vitamin D hormone with the regulation of serotonin synthesis. Now, uh, what are measures of serotonin synthesis? Is serotonin is made from the amino acid tryptophan. Now, can we check for tryptophan levels? Yes, we can. Uh, these tests are also available here in the Philippines. And can we test for um, serotonin itself? We test a metabolite of serotonin called 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, and we can actually do that, much like we can test uh, for homovanillic acid, which is a metabolite of dopamine. Now, in her lecture, she might mention uh, kinuranic acid, and we also can measure that. These are not uh, just research laboratory measures now. We can actually measure them for your patients. Now, 
Her other articles also on vitamin D and its relationship with omega-3 fatty acids, uh, the control of serotonin synthesis in part two of her paper in FASAB 2016 journal, The Relevance for ADHD, Bipolar Disorder, Schizophrenia, and Impulsive Behavior. Now, uh, can we measure omega-3 uh, in your patients here? Yes, you can. You will hear her talking about icosapentaenoic acid and docohexaenoic acid, both of which are actually measurable for your patients. Continuing basic medical education is an upgrade of basic medical information from when we graduated from medical school. Now, Science News is actually a magazine that's written for high school students, and I am subscribed to it. It's an easy read. And uh, in uh, April 2, 2016 issue, um, it says here, microbes can play games with the mind. The bacteria in your gut may help decide who gets anxiety and depression. Now, what do we need to upgrade in our knowledge on how this happens? So there's a new important axis in the body. It's called the enteric microbiota gut-brain axis. When we were in medical school, we only learned about the gut-brain axis, but now we know that the gut microbiota actually is the third part of that axis and influences the brain directly. Uh, gut microbiota is the forgotten organ and serves as a virtual organ within an organ and has the metabolic activity of an organ itself. Now, the gut microbiota is a postnatal organ that begins at birth and uh, is actually has an adult like uh, um, adult um, stable adult signature in, in one year of age. Now. There is uh, increasing bacterial diversity until two to three years of age, and as you can see in this slide, there is uh, decreased inter-individual variability at the time. Now, when you perturb this distribution, this distribution is as unique as your fingerprint. When you uh, perturb this distribution, your body will tend to go back to this distribution. Now, can we take a look at what's going on in your gut? Yes, we can take a look at your stool. We can uh, take a look at infections, inflammations, insufficiency of bile, uh, for fatty acid digestion, insufficiency of uh, pancreatic enzymes, and then imbalances uh, among uh, poten potentially pathogenic bacteria and beneficial bacteria. We can dig deeper, take a look at the diversity of your uh, gut bacteria in the stool, and of course, the lower diversity, the worse off you are. Um, on the relative abundance, you could see here the bottom blue segments are actually the two, impor the, the two important um, phyla, the bacteroidetes and firmicutes, which have been studied at and have been implicated in the efficiency uh, of the body it, to absorb, uh, to, to uh, um, metabolize nutrients. Now, we can also dig deeper and take a look at the different populations of gut bacteria by PCR. So CBME is a new teaching of basic medical information that was never taught to us in medical school. Now, your patient may be subscribed to the NIH newsletter and may find this. The NIH study finds calorie restriction lowers some risk factors for age-related diseases. Now, how do we relate that? We don't have any background on how we relate this back to uh, the body of your patient. And we know that calorie restriction induces mitochondrial biogenesis and bioenergetic efficiency. Um, the way to look at a cell, the most convenient way for me to look at a cell is to look at it as two organisms. One is an aerobic, anaerobic organism generating energy without oxygen, and the other one is by aerobic respiration generating energy using oxygen. Now, Dr. Douglas Wallace um, has uh, already given us the mitochondrial bioenergetic etiology of disease. He's been working on this for the past 33 years, and it's actually very simple. Uh, don't get dismayed by the complexity of this slide. Environmental factors, mitochondrial DNA variation, nuclear DNA variation, can all affect uh, oxidative uh, phosphorylation. Uh, it can cause uh, progressive bioenergetic decline and producing degenerative diseases, aging, metabolic disease, cancer, and immunologic disease. Now, when we were in medical school, we were only taught about the anatomical perspective on biology of medicine, the Darwinian paradigm of evolution, the anatomical paradigm of disease, and the Mendelian paradigm of inheritance. It is about time that we included the bioenergetic perspective on biology and medicine, the bioenergetic paradigm of evolution, bioenergetic paradigm of disease, and Mendelian and mitochondrial paradigm of inheritance. 
So can we measure the metabolites of uh, anaerobic and uh, aerobic energy production? Yes, we can. Uh, Anaerobic here, we could see lactic acid and pyruvic acid, and of course, those for energy metabolism should be familiar to you. These are metabolites of the Krebs cycle, things that you used to memorize in medical school. Well, bad news for you, we can measure for you it for you now, and you have to know them again. Why? Why do you have to know them? Because any imbalances in the metabolites, in, uh, in, in these metabolites, would signal deficiencies in cofactors for the production of energy. So, CBME is a refresher, an update, an upgrade, and a new teaching of basic medical information that was never taught to us in medical school. I don't know what Dr. Rhonda Patrick will think of this, but if your patient brings me this type of information, I don't know how to answer them. The biotechnologist claims to have created an anti-aging vodka, and uh, you will have, you're on your own to justify this to your patients. Now, Continuing basic medical education lectures are held under the purview of health optimization medicine. And it's a framework to incorporate wellness in your, medical in your clinical practice, and it's what I'm pioneering in. So how do we bring medicine home? First, let's have a very easy definition of health. I give this at every lecture. Health, it's a clinically actionable definition of health meaning forget about what the health, World Health Organization says, what can we do about the health of the patients? So health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by A, the absence of disease, and the B, the maintenance of balance between anabolism and catabolism, according to C, the cycle of life of the, of the organism. This is a very simple definition. Please take it with you. The way to look at it is this, and remember it, is like, for example, if you have food, they have to uh, go through catabolic pathways to produce energy, cellular building blocks, and heat. And of course, energy and cellular building blocks will drive your anabolic pathways to produce your uh, macromolecules like protein and eventually muscle. I have um, bodybuilder clients, for example, who overclock their anabolic pathways with synthetic anabolic steroids and therefore the energy is all shoved into that pathway and guess what They're, these are very sickly people because there's no energy left for healing and repair so what does this mean just because you're not sick doesn't mean that you're well it only means that you're not sick so fitness our uh, guest lecturer has uh, a founded a co-founded a website uh, and a movement uh, found my fitness Fitness is an optimal physiologic state that allows one to handle stress, physical, emotional, and mental, from a baseline state according to the life cycle of an organism. This is very easy to remember. Physically, emotion, being physically, emotionally, and mentally fit asks the question, fit for what? So you may be fit to run a marathon, but you're not healthy. I may be healthy, but I'm not fit to run a marathon. So if health equals A plus B plus C, then the absence of disease is illness medicine. And the balance between anabolism and catabolism according to the cycle of life of the organism is health optimization medicine. Let's visualize this quickly. I created a health wrench. Health is the optimal physiologic state characterized by A, the absence of disease, as illness medicine. So how do we practice illness medicine? Western medicine is, of course, called allopathic medicine, the kind of medicine that we practice. And then there's uh, alternative medicine, which are alternative uh, approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Complementary medicine, which are complementary approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Integrative medicine and functional medicine, which are integrated and functional approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Now, let's flip that over to remind us that we are diagnosing and treating diseases when we are in illness medicine. Now, we maintain a balance between uh, anabolism and catabolism by detecting borderline deficiencies and subtle toxicities uh, in the metabolites and try to push those uh, levels to up to the optimal levels according to the life cycle of the organism. For example, kids uh, are, are more anabolic, older people have more uh, generally a more catabolic general state of being. Now, so that's health optimization medicine. Illness medicine uses quantitative statistics. Of course, your antibiotics have to work across population, and they have to check that. However, um, we are after the quality of life. We do a lot of reporting using qualitative statistics. And um, you guys use evidence-based medicine, or more appropriately called evidence-based illness medicine, because you're dealing with illness. However, uh, at Health Optimization Medicine, we use what's called evidence-informed clinical care. In a landmark editorial um, in 2011, 
uh, they essayed on uh, evidence-based medicine versus evidence-informed individualized care, uh, chronicling the rise and fall of evidence medicine, the rise of person-centered clinical medicine, and our guest lecturer is very familiar with the Precision Medicine Initiative because this has found a home in cancer treatments where the cancer treatments are actually tailored according to the single nu nucleotide polymorphisms that may affect your cancer chemotherapy. Now, again, a reminder that in illness medicine, we diagnose and treat diseases. In health optimization medicine, we detect and balance borderline deficiencies and subtle toxicities. Now, why should we do this? Why, why is this important? Because, let's take a look at an actual, at an actual example. In illness medicine, we know that rickets or adult rickets osteomalacia is really, are really the only two diseases for vitamin D deficiency. And we're good at that. We are able to, to prescribe you know, treatment for rickets. We're very definitive about it. We're able to prescribe treatment for nutritional osteomalacia. We're very definitive about it. But then when we are told that healthy people need to add vitamin D, and it's affected by age, latitude, season, BMI, skin color, sun avoidance behavior, then suddenly we don't know how to give a prescription. Take a look at this, we are all over the place. Uh, it's, uh, the RDA of the Institute of Medicine is 600, the uh, 4,000 is the upper limit of the Institute of Medicine and the Euro European Food and Safety Administration, and 10,000 for those at risk according to Endocrine Society. So, why is it that when it comes to health, we are all over the place? Because we are asking the wrong question. What we're asking is, what diseases that it, does it prevent? Again, we're looking at the disease, rather than asking, what is optimal for our health? For this, we'd like to take a look, of course, evolutionarily. Um, there are the Maasai and the Hadzabi tribes of Africa, where uh, there is uh, very little uh, chronic uh, diseases and very little cancer and uh, virtually non-existent and you could see that their levels averaged about 50 nanograms per milliliter uh, per mil. Now, how do we do the detection? We do the detection using uh, the science of clinical metabolomics which uh, probably has crept upon us but has been with us for the past 20 years and is vastly improving. Now, the metabolome refers to the complete set of small molecule metabolites such as metabolic intermediates, hormones, and other signaling molecules, and secondary metabolites to be found within a biological sample. Now, why, do we, why did we choose the metabolome? Because uh, the genes uh, can, can tell us what can happen. Uh, the uh, transcriptomics can tell us what appears to be happening. Proteomics um, can tell us what makes it happen and metabolomics uh, tells us what has happened and is happening, and that is what we want for our patient. So in other words, metabolomics bridges the, the gap between the genotype and phenotype. This is the main slide for um, what we do in health optimization medicine. And if you could just follow me quickly, we'll take a look at the gears first. Uh, we look at, uh, if we look at genetics, we, many of us are focused on nuclear DNA, but we should also remember that there's mitochondrial DNA that we have, we have to consider, and other nucleic acids, like uh, uh, microRNAs, uh, for example, that exert effects uh, on us. And then for symbiotic partners, we know that the mitochondria is an endosymbiont, and gut microbiota are exosymbionts in our system. And, and for the environment, you have the direct and indirect signals from the environment. Sunlight, for example, is a direct signal. And then time, uh, where we could take a look at the very long evolutionary time or the short, short circadian time. Now, what we do is we detect the metabolic markers and we can detect the early onset of metabolic deregulations. So we detect and balance those. In illness medicine, we actually detect disease markers and we do disease management. So all we're doing in health optimization medicine is actually looking at the metabolome and seeing what uh, metabolic uh, the regulations there are uh, in there. By the way, we each have our own uh, metabolic uh, phenotype or the shorthand for it is a metabotype. Now, after we do the detection, how do we prescribe a balancing regimen for the patient? So if we are looking at, um, so uh, the detection is done by metabolomics, and if we are looking at nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and genetics, we actually use uh, epigenetics. 
Uh, for example, if uh, the vitamin B9 level is low, then we can give your patient um, methyl tetrahydrofolate and take a look at whether or not there's improvement in the methylation pathways. If we are looking at the mitochondria and gut microbiome, we can take a look at the bioenergetics and gut immune system. For example, if your ADP cancerbaric acids are rising, then we know that there must be uh, your long chain um, uh, fatty acids must have been uh, are, are having uh, difficult time entering your mitochondria. Now. Uh, for direct and indirect signals, we use the science of exposomics. Um, for example, if uh, it has been shown that the prevalence of chronic lymphocytic leukemia is higher in children who live under high tension wires. So if you want the child to improve, including your chemotherapy treatment, you have to move your patient out of that toxic environment. And for evolutionary and circadian rhythm, we use evolutionary medicine and chronobiology. Uh, for example, the, pale, the whole paleo movement is actually based on uh, evolutionary, evolutionary medicine. So these are the uh, elements. The detection is by metabolomics, and then the uh, formulation of your balancing plan are based on the sciences of epigenetics, bioenergetics, exposomics, and evolutionary medicine. Now, this is a simple example of uh, epigenetics. You have food, it has folic acid, there's uh, beta in there, choline, B vitamins, and it finds its way uh, into methylating your DNA, and there is one of the mechanisms for, of uh, epigenetics. Um, for bioenergetics and the gut immune system, uh, you can actually refer to this podcast. Um, this, he seems to be inviting this guy um, uh, who seems to know what he's uh, saying about gut, gut microbiome and uh, mitochondria. Uh, it's from Calix Performance. And um, um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, our guest speaker tonight, also has a lot of uh, podcasts in her site. I shall be discussing that later. And this, this um, a podcast require resources uh, for them. And they're doing this out of love for educating us properly. So they are both uh, signed up for Patreon. So Guys, give them uh, the price of a cup of coffee, and um, uh, let's continue their good work. Now, so health optimization medicine uh, framework, uh, it, this is a summary of it. So essentially, you have your metabolome, which is at optimal levels. You detect the subtle toxicities and borderline deficiencies and try to push them to optimal levels. You are not diagnosing or treating any disease with home. You are detecting subtle toxicities and borderline deficiencies in the metabolomic network, like nutrients and hormones, and balancing them to optimal levels. Now, the key word here is network. This is the art of home, the art of homemaking. Um, because when you touch a node in a network, you are going to touch several other nodes. So there are many moving parts at any one time. So we cannot afford intellectual sloth in this specialty. Now, what's interesting nowadays is that you can meet someone virtually before you actually meet her in person. Uh, the way I met uh, Dr. Patrick is a friend of mine actually came screaming down the hall and said, hey, Ted, you know, you ought to see this lady. She's in a podcast and she talks as fast as you. She's information dense. Her favorite um, phrase is uh, a study show. And when she, she doesn't know something, she just says, I don't know. He says, sounds like you. And so I go and take a look uh, at uh, the lady in the podcast, and it's a Joe Rogan Experience podcast. And here she is. I actually got this clip um, from her first podcast. And she's, she's brilliant. She's articulate. And um, I was walking yesterday, and a group of important guys said, oh, we signed up for uh, her lecture because she's easy on the eyes. Sorry, guys. Her husband is here. So... Um, she finished her biochemistry degree at uh, UCSD, uh, her PhD in biomedical science at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. She occupied various research uh, positions in various centers from there and became a post postdoctoral fellow, then visiting scientist at Shorey, the Children's Hospital, Oakland Research Institute, with Dr. Bruce Ames. And if there are any oncologists here, uh, you still, it, his doc, the, the AIMS test is still widely used for mutagenicity testing, and I think it's still taught in medical schools. Her research and publications uh, show the links or relationships among mitochondrial metabolism, apoptosis, and cancer. 
uh, micronutrients, inflammation and DNA damage, vitamin D, brain function and behavior, insulin signaling, protein misfolding, and neurodegenerative diseases. She is a co-founder of Found My Fitness, an online platform that promotes optimal health and performance through deeper understanding of biology. Here are samples of her podcasts, you know, Brain DHA, DHA Advantage, do antioxidants uh, cause cancer, the Terry Walsh protocol that reverses multiple sclerosis, and I think I actually talked about that in one of my newsletters. Now, tonight, she's going to uh, discuss with us um, micronutrients for the prevention of age-related diseases and brain dysfunction, in particular, magnesium as being essential in DNA repair, vitamin D controlling over a thousand genes and tying into longer lifespans, depression correlating with inflammation and omega-3 fatty acids, internal gut environment affecting mood and immune system, caloric restriction impeding cardiovascular disease, cancer, brain atrophy, and nerve degeneration, and gene expression being influenced by food, stress, and exercise, or epigenetics. Now you know why I had to do a front act for her. Um, I'd like to put a bee in her bonnet because uh, this, uh, because this uh, uh, podcast in particular um, uh, uh, upset me. Uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee uh, was, is the uh, author of uh, Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, it's about cancer. And he won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for that. However, um, just because you're a Pulitzer Prize winner means that you're right with your second book. So he wrote The Gene, and on May 17, 2016, uh, it was released on Amazon. On May, sorry, on um, May um, uh, 16, he went to National Public Radio and in Fresh Air, um, gave a podcast on the power of genes and um, the line between biology and destiny. And at exactly at minute 22, he says, in fact, a lot of people have proposed that we should probably get rid of this word, epigenetics, because it confuses people. And I know that Dr. Patrick is going to go after things like this in her podcast, so I'm put, just putting this bee in her bonnet. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome and present Dr. Rhonda Patrick.